Life Squared, a novel written by and read by George Trombley. Chapter 1, George. George clicked pay now and half of what he earned for the month disappeared. As he put the phone down, trumpets roared and confetti showered the screen. A cheery voice spoke. It's time to celebrate. You've reached a milestone. George muttered under his breath. Celebrate being a slave to the bank? A grim reaper holding a scythe appeared on the screen and spoke in an evil voice. You did it. You killed your debt. A tombstone etched with $362,000 poked up through the grass. The bony arms of the grim reaper raised in the air and slashed diagonally through the tombstone. Blood filled the entire screen. The blood rolled off, revealing a tombstone with a new amount of $179,000 and today's date below it. Another three years to go, George said, tossing his phone onto the battered leather sofa in his run-down one-room apartment. He grabbed the soy milk Kim had brought last Thursday from the fridge and poured the remainder into a sweet-smelling, cheap supermarket brand cereal. George hadn't taken a weekend off since his MMA career ended with a smashed knee, leaving him with nearly $400,000 in debt. Sick of fighting for his time, his on-off girlfriend Kim convinced him to give her Thursdays. Every training session reminded him of the colossal mistake he made fighting without insurance, but Thursdays with Kim helped keep his mind off the rich, entitled elites he had to work for to pay off his debt. On the table next to the cereal sat George's most recent escape book, We Keep the Dead Close. The black shelf behind George's sofa was filled with similar musty true crime novels that George collected from thrift shops. He flipped to the doggy-eared page in the final chapter and picked up where he left off last night. From the couch, his phone chimed, alerting him of a new training request. Not again. What's wrong with this guy? George had already declined previous requests from the same guy. Everything about this guy screamed pain in the ass. His profile had three and a half stars, and he was requesting a Thursday 11 a.m. session despite it being marked as unavailable. I sure as hell don't want to work on my Kim day. George was ready to decline a third time, if not for the message attached to the request. Message from Prospect. Read before you decline. I require a trainer of your quality for a year-long unique project. I will pay three times your normal hourly rate for a guaranteed three-hour weekly session. Cash will be paid discreetly at the end of every session. Three times my rate? George reread the message to make sure he understood it. Something seems fishy. George was tempted to accept, but he had questions. Who is this guy? Why spend so much? What's so special about me? Why pay discreetly? No sane person would walk away from this offer, and George reasoned that if he could avoid taxes by getting paid in cash, he could finally pay off his debt. This debt was a memory of his failed career as an MMA fighter. George knew that it had no place in his new life, and had decided that once the debt was gone, he would properly propose to Kim. I guess the third time's the charm. George clicked accept client. Now he had to break the news to Kim. He tapped Kim's name in the messages app. Hey, I won't be able to make lunch on Thursday. Oh, anything I should know about? No, I accepted a new client who insists on Thursday for his first session. I thought Thursdays were for us. They are, but this guy was persistent, and he offered triple my normal rate. Triple? As in 600 an hour? George didn't talk much about his past, especially his financial troubles. And although Kim wasn't aware of George's large debt, she was previously paying him to train, so she knew his rates. Actually, I raised my rate to 250 last month, so 750 an hour? Wow, who is this guy, and does he need a young, beautiful PR agent? I'm not sure who he is besides his name. I'm meeting him at the Letter building on the 100th floor, so maybe he's an executive at Letter? Are you kidding me? Letter? I strongly recommend you reconsider this guy. Reconsider? You think I should charge more? No, not that. Give me a second to look for something. The only thing George read were his books, training requests, and messages from Kim. Consequently, news of the world came to him via conversations with Kim, whose work required her to be hyper-aware. George knew there was a company called Letter, spelled L-E-T-R, 
and knew it had built a large building in the center of the city, but he didn't know much more than that. Shin Hye Kim, who went by her last name Kim because non-Koreans always messed up her first name, worked as an independent public relations manager. She constantly scoured social media, news articles, and watched expose videos all day long. After a few moments, Kim sent two links. Check these out. There's more, but this is what I can find for now. The first link was to an article from the Texas Daily Telegram titled, Letter Under Fire for Animal Testing at Dallas Facility. An anonymous whistleblower working for Letter at their now-shuttered Letter Research Facility in Dallas claimed that Letter had killed over 100 chimpanzees while testing a new product, then covered up their deaths by incinerating them. Letter, of course, denied the claims, and a subsequent investigation by the Dallas Special Investigations Unit found no proof to support the claim. Kim's face always lit up when talking about a good conspiracy theory. It often led to stimulating debates where George enjoyed playing devil's advocate to Kim's theories. Could this be a simple shakedown? To George, it felt like a quick way for a disgruntled employee to make a quick buck either from paid interviews or maybe blackmailing letter. The second link was to a video titled The Many Evils of the Letter Company. It was a well-made video released just a few days ago with dramatic music and fancy motion graphics. The channel was known for its viral videos exposing the wrongdoings of large companies. The video showed a map of hundreds of factories, research facilities, and office buildings owned by Letter throughout the world. According to the video, the CEO of Letter was merely a figurehead and actually had no power at the company. The narrator spoke, this behemoth of a company so intertwined in our daily lives has no accountability to the billions of people that interact with its products every day. Its repeated scandals are left unanswered and unpunished. Headlines of various scandals involving Letter flashed across the screen with the sound of thunder for each one. The narration continued. Letter's response to these major scandals is to have their puppet CEO step down while paying them millions of dollars each time. Then soon thereafter, another figurehead CEO takes over, making hollow promises of change to assuage the public outcry. Is Letter that big? George tried to think if he knew of any Letter products he owned, or had seen for that matter, but couldn't come up with any. Letter had an extensive product line consisting of large medical scanning equipment and was well known for its automation robotics. The narrator's voice deepened slightly. Now let's look at the three actions by letter that are cause for concern. The next segment brought into doubt the circumstances surrounding letter's acquisition of a block of highly valued land in the middle of downtown San Diego to build the letter building, its new flagship research facility. It seemed that the owners of a long-held theater on the land where the building now stands had refused to sell for years. The video cut to news clips of the theater owner vowing to never sell with him saying, over my dead body in one clip and San Diego is better without letter in another. Yet less than six months after proclaiming letter will never get my land. The building broke ground and the theater owner was refusing interview requests. The narrator posed the question, what tactics did letter use to oust this owner from his property? And more importantly, why is the once vocal theater owner now silent? The next segment rehashed the supposed deaths of the chimpanzees in Dallas. Apparently, Letter had illegally imported chimpanzees using their extensive, unchecked trade routes. But now, instead of 100, there were over 150 chimpanzees murdered by Letter all in an effort to make profit. This was the only point that felt substantial to George. If it were true, Letter should have been penalized, but the video offered no proof. Letter had, however, admitted, while unfortunately a few chimpanzees had died in their custody, those deaths were from natural causes. The third segment felt a bit forced to George. It stated that unlike public companies, Letter had no obligation to be transparent because it had no stockholders to answer to. The narrator asked, If Letter has nothing to hide, why don't they reveal who their clients are, how they're funded, and why not disclose who's actually in control? George watched the rest of the video, not convinced that Letter was as evil as the narrator claimed. While on the surface, these questions, along with the ominous music, made it seem that Letter was up to something nefarious, George reasoned that it was in Letter's best interest to make their funding and client list private. 
It would only give potential competitors a heads up if they released such information. Not everything's a conspiracy. Sometimes it's just business. George certainly wasn't going to cancel such a high-paying training session based on what Kim had sent, but he wanted to let her down softly. He messaged her. Interesting information to consider. Right? Letter's up to no good. So does this mean I'll see you for our brunch Thursday? George initially typed, I'm really just curious to meet the client. But he decided he needed a reason beyond mere curiosity or Kim might keep sending him links. So he told her the truth. The money's too good to refuse or else I would certainly cancel. Don't let the money blind you. Letter puts on a good face, but they're up to no good, I tell you. Even if Letter was up to no good as Kim thought, George knew that once he paid down his debt and was kneeling in front of Kim proposing to her, it would all be worth it. I'm not blinded, but that money is pretty shiny. Also, I'm not sure refusing the job would change much. Capitalism at its finest. Just be careful, all right? I will. Maybe we can meet up Thursday evening for drinks? Kim loved a good drink and good conversation, and she especially loved that George always let her pick the place. I'm 100% up for drinks and socializing, even if it's a bit later than normal. All right, I'll text you when the session's done. Kim sent a jumping rabbit animation showing her excitement. Promise me you'll be on guard. You know me, I'm always on guard and trust no one. That wasn't exactly true. While it's true George distrusted new people, once you gained his trust, he often dropped his guard. George put his phone in night mode, brushed and flossed his teeth, then neatly placed his training equipment near the door of his apartment. The letter building, completed two years ago, was north of the gas lamp quarter in San Diego. Christened as the tallest, most advanced building in the world, at exactly 3,200 feet, it dominated the San Diego skyline. The first floor of the letter building didn't have a lobby with white marble walls and black square sofas like most modern buildings. It was a self-contained forest dubbed simply as The Park. It was the largest public park in the world, contained in the world's largest atrium by height and volume, filled with ponds, five-story high cliffs, redwood trees, and thousands of variety of fauna. It was a feat in modern engineering mixed with the beauty of a national park. The park had an AI-controlled weather system that could generate all four seasons. Much to the delight of the San Diego locals and tourists from around the world, spectacular rain and snowstorms rarely seen in California could be created on demand and witnessed on a schedule. George exited the transport in front of the letter building around 10.40 a.m. There didn't appear to be any doors on the first floor. Its steel beams carefully hidden amongst trees and rocks, the building seemed to float above the ground. As George walked towards the building, he was met with a jet of air gushing up from a two-inch grating lining the entire front of the building. The air curtain, as it was called, erased the sweltering heat of a decade-long drought and replaced it with the cool, lightly humid breeze of a spring day in April. It wasn't anything like the harsh air conditioning he expected from a large skyscraper. It felt more like the air cooled as it blew over a calm mountain lake. An occasional raindrop hit parts of George's body as he entered deeper into the park. Letter Building, like many newer buildings, had installed an Omni Guide, which was one of the hundreds of extension agents for the advanced AI system called Omni, developed by Letter a decade earlier. This Omni agent's full name was Omni Destination Guide, but everyone just knew it as Omni Guide. Its purpose was to eliminate ugly building maps and signage that took away from a visitor's experience. It could offer personal directed wave guidance when requested or automatically depending on user preference. Letter had open sourced the Omni code for the entire world to use free of patent fees. As a result, Omni was now the de facto standard for all types of automation agents and information tasks. Omni saw George and realized he needed assistance. Hello, welcome to Letter. My Omni ID is Letter. You can call my ID or just say Omni if you require assistance or have questions. Omni Guide spoke directly to George with a directed sound wave that only George could hear. If George had Omni Presence Mode enabled, Omni would have known of his training session on the 100th floor and already guided him to the elevator, but George had opted out of Omni Presence Mode. It gave him the uneasy feeling he was being watched. 
He didn't like Omni rummaging through all of his personal information. Annoyed, George replied, Just guide me to a floor map and I'll figure it out on my own. Omni Guide replied, I apologize for the inconvenience, but there are no floor maps. I see that you have Omnipresence mode disabled. If you give me permission, I can give you step-by-step -step instructions to your destination. Most people born after 2020 wouldn't dream of disabling Omnipresence mode, or opium as it was colloquially called. With opium enabled, all parts of a person's life were tracked and analyzed to a level only dreamed of 10 years prior. This allowed opium to accurately predict what a person needed or wanted before the person themselves knew. With its unprecedented access to a person's data, it became the ultimate personal assistant, which was the reason it was so popular. George responded to the Omni Guide. I need to head to floor 100. I give you permission to guide me to the elevator. I apologize, but access to the 100th floor is restricted. If you allow me to access your Omni identifier, I can verify your access permissions. Nah, I'm not comfortable allowing access to my identifier. My name is George Williams, and I'm meeting with Mr. Square. He couldn't remember the last name, but he didn't need to. OmniGuide responded, I have confirmed your appointment. Multiple elevators stop on the 100th floor. I will vocally guide you to the closest one. Yeah, okay, George responded. There were many advantages to opium, but it meant giving up much of your privacy. The older generation fought hard for privacy against systems like opium and scored a large victory with the Digital Privacy Rights Amendment of 2034. The DPRA gave American citizens sweeping rights to how their private data is collected and used. It meant that if they wished, they could become almost completely anonymous or go off the grid even in a highly digitally connected city such as San Diego. Companies now had severe limitations on what private data it could sell, trade, or track. The OmniGuide spoke. It takes about 12 minutes to get to the elevator. First, walk down the path in front of you for about five minutes. Once you get to the fork in the path, head left. 12 minutes, George balked. How big is this place exactly? The letter building is the tallest, George interrupted. Never mind, it was a rhetorical question. Ah, my apologies. Opponents of the DPRA warned if complete anonymity were allowed, American cities would become havens for criminal activity. But even staunch proponents of the amendment were surprised by the nearly 15% drop in major crimes in the five years since the amendment was ratified. There was much debate if the drop in crime was the result of the DPRA, the introduction of UBI, Universal Basic Income, or a combination of both. Either way, after the multitude of tragic events in the 2020s and 2030s, dubbed the bad luck decades, it was a welcome change. As directed, George turned left at the fork on the well-worn path. OmniGuide spoke again. Keep on the path for another three minutes, until a large pond on the left. From there, head towards the waterfalls. Sheesh. Waterfalls? George said aloud. Yes, there are seven waterfalls in the park, OmniGuide informed him. Shall I tell you about other features of the park? George now wished he had asked a person for directions instead of the OmniGuide. No, please just tell me how to get to the elevator. I don't require any other information. Understood. I'll continue guidance at the waterfall. In the late 2030s, living an analog life wasn't possible. George understood and accepted this, but he cherished his privacy and avoided chatty AI when possible. George only interacted with OmniGuides when he absolutely needed to, like today. It was getting harder and harder to avoid Omni this and Omni that. Recently, even supermarkets and large box stores began implementing OmniGuides to help customers find products. As shoppers roamed the store, the OmniGuide would suggest related products or special recipes of interest to the shopper. In-store sales increased on average 36% with OmniGuide, and combined with data from customers with Omnipresence Mode Enable, Omni Logistics was able to predict the product needs of the store's customers' base quite accurately. As George approached the waterfall, OmniGuide spoke. As you pass the waterfall, there will be another fork in the path. Head to the right. The path will end in front of the East 2 elevator. The path ended at the foot of a towering redwood tree. George looked around but saw no elevator. OmniGuide spoke. You have arrived at East Elevator 2. The elevator will arrive shortly. George wondered if this OmniGuide had been given the ability to prank people. 
He felt kind of stupid standing there holding his equipment in front of a tree. Kim told him letter might be dangerous, but she hadn't said they were pranksters. Elevator arriving, OmniGuide informed George. A large section of bark on the redwoods sunk into the tree, revealing a brushed metallic door. The door opened to the most spacious elevator George had ever seen. The entire circumference of the round elevator and ceiling was covered in an array of what looked like decorative black and white ball fixtures. It seemed out of place in the middle of a forest. George entered the elevator and an information panel near the doors automatically displayed, Next Destination, Floor 100. The doors remained opened for a few moments before a tall and objectively beautiful woman with emerald green dyed hair entered the elevator holding a large box. The elevator's information panel updated its destination list by adding floor 92. George spoke to the lady. Crazy place, huh? She responded, You get used to it. It seems like it's your first time here. You might want to get a good grip on your things. George felt the pressure in his ears change like when flying in the pressurized cabin of an airplane. George was holding his massage table under his right arm and a rolled up blue yoga mat under his left. Also, hanging from his left shoulder was a reddish gym bag with an assortment of heavy-duty resistance bands for stretching exercises. The elevator began to ascend. Its takeoff speed took George by surprise and he tightened his grip on the massage table. Wow, you weren't wrong. I was not ready for the downward pressure, George said to the woman. The woman laughed. Yep, I'm almost certain I've gotten a few centimeters shorter since transferring here from Dallas. George was ready for more conversation. But the elevator slowed smoothly, yet dramatically, at the 92nd floor. George felt a bit lightheaded as blood rushed to his head. The seals on the doors popped and opened to a floor bustling with seemingly hundreds of people walking to and from cubicles. They were either punching data into spreadsheets, manipulating 3D models, or attending to a row of what looked like mannequins. Some standing with full bodies, and others just with a torso and head. What am I getting myself into? George adjusted the grip on his table. The woman walked off the elevator, turning back to George. Tell Square to get donuts ready for Team Shania. Before he could ask her what she meant, the door sealed shut, and the elevator began its short and fast ascent to the hundredth floor. Weird. He wondered how she could possibly know his client's name. As soon as he walked off the elevator, he knew why. In the same place that had hundreds of cubicles and God knows how many mannequins on the 92nd floor, there was just one circular desk, albeit the largest desk George had ever seen. He guessed that the desk was just 10 meters from the elevator he rode up. There were other elevator banks evenly spaced two per wall, with names like South 2, North 1, in large metallic lettering above the doors. To the left of the circular desk was a set of brown leather chairs with full-body mannequins similar to what he had seen on the 92nd floor standing on either side. Beyond the desk was empty office space. Gray carpeting extended all the way to the west wall of windows overlooking the city and another two elevator banks. It seemed like an incredible waste of space to George. A man, seeming to be in his late 50s or early 60s with peppered gray hair, dressed in casual business attire, stood with his back towards the East 2 elevator. He was rapidly typing numbers into a spreadsheet visible on a hundred-inch screen. Without turning to look at George, the man pointed to the left and spoke just loud enough for George to hear. You can set up over there, he said, pointing to the left of the chairs. Let me know when you're ready. George knew for sure he would mess up the last name, but he needed to make sure it was the client. You're Mr. Puppin Maker? George asked. I see you share my dislike of opium. The only thing it's good for is scheduling. It's pronounced Puppenmacher, he responded saying the name in a German accent. If George had opium enabled, he wouldn't have mistaken the name since OmniGuide or OmniScheduler would have pronounced it for him once Mr. Puppenmacher was in range. Yeah, I figured I'd get it wrong. I'll set the table up and we'll get started. George went to the area Mr. Puppenmacher had pointed and unfolded his massage table. It was more heavy duty than you would expect from its light weight. It cost more than George had wanted to spend, but it was important to have the right equipment. Made with the same carbon nanotube material as the space elevator being built in New Miami, George knew it wouldn't buckle or collapse during a post-workout massage like the first cheap one he bought. George unfurled the yoga mat and unzipped the bag of resistance bands. All right, Mr. He paused to get the name right. Poopin Macher. I'm ready when you are. Mr. Poopin Macher typed one last set of numbers into his spreadsheet, then opened the bottom drawer of his desk 
pulled out a pair of black shorts and a black mesh t-shirt. Much to George's surprise, the man got totally naked, not hiding any part of his body, and slipped on the shorts and shirt. He sloppily folded the clothes he had taken off and tossed them into the drawer, kicking it closed and walked over to George. The man was thin and pale. It seemed to George that he must not have exercised much as his muscles were devoid of any definition. In the three years since George's injuries changed his career path, he had established a well-earned reputation amongst personal trainers. Outside of his volunteer work, his clients tended to be rich, well-known, powerful, or all three. He had certainly seen some eccentric character traits in his clients, but until today, he had yet to see one casually get naked on the first session. He was hoping there wasn't some hidden kink behind the absurd amount of money the client was paying. Mr. Poupinmacher extended his arm for a handshake. Let's drop the formalities. You can call me square. George knew from the client profile that this was not a nickname, but his actual name. There was also a private note from one past trainer about the client's argumentative nature. So George decided not to ask him about his name, although he was naturally curious as to its origin. All right, Square. I'm George, so you can just call me George. I've never met anyone without a last name, Square responded. Ah, it's Williams, George Williams. Well, at least your name is easier to pronounce than my cursed name, Square said as he chuckled. Square continued. It seems you're the best personal trainer in San Diego. Why do you think you're so highly reviewed? Well, I'm not sure if I'm the best, but I take pride in my work. Whether my clients are down on their luck or paying me three times my rate, I treat them with the same respect. On weekends, George volunteered his services for group sessions at the People First Shelter downtown. The clients at the shelter were often so overwhelmed with life circumstances that they neglected their bodies and health. Volunteering was George's way of getting balance from the dirty feeling he sometimes got from the vanity of many of his wealthy clients. I must say I applaud your efforts helping people of all circumstances live longer, Square said. And there's nothing wrong with having a high hourly rate. We all need to pay our bills. And as of yet, we are only on this planet for a limited amount of time. So the more money we earn, the more time we get to enjoy the planet's finer things. Seems logical. George paused for a moment to reflect on his words, then responded, We are in agreement. Square smiled and spoke again. It seems you are very selective with your paying clients. I've never had to work so hard to pay someone money. I'm curious as to why you finally accepted my request despite my reputation. Well, I'll be honest. Your poor reviews didn't make it easy. I accepted for two reasons. The biggest reason is the money. Square nodded his head. Now I find that money is a great motivation for most people. And your second reason? George continued. The second reason is pure curiosity as to why you would pay me so much, although I'm not complaining. I'm sure once we get started, my curiosity will be quenched. Square's eyebrows scrunched downward. Well, curiosity isn't a bad thing, but curiosity has been known to kill a cat or two. After a short pause, Square laughed off the silence. Is this a threat? George was careful in his response. Well, Mr. Poopenmacher, I assure you I'm not a reporter looking for a scoop, if that's what you're worried about. I'm well aware of who you are, and I don't think you are one to talk about other people's business. Well aware, huh? George changed the topic. Uh, how about we get started with some stretching? Square shook his head. Listen, I know you're the pro here, but stretching is the last thing I want to do. Okay, then. We can stretch at the end. No, you don't understand. I have no intention of stretching. Let's just hit hard. I can take it, Square said firmly. George was getting a sense of what the private note meant about Square being argumentative, but he wasn't going to let it bother him. He was going to be paid handsomely to be there, and stretching wasn't absolutely necessary. George often skipped stretching himself to save time. That's fine, Square. We don't need to stretch. How about we take a light jog around the office, at least to warm up? Fair enough. George started jogging towards the East 2 elevator, and Square jogged after him. I'm guessing two laps should be a good warm up. We'll use the elevator door as our lap marker. Square matched his speed and was now jogging on George's left side. Neither of them spoke during the first lap. George estimated the entire lap was just over half a mile, and his watch confirmed that they had run 0.56 miles since he tapped start. This office is absolutely huge for one man. 
George wondered if Square ever used any of the other seven elevators. This is the first time I've done laps in a skyscraper, George said, breaking the silence. Me too, Square said as he chuckled. Well, you're doing good. Most people can't jog for a hundred feet, much less a half of a mile. I stand and walk a lot. I suppose I've built up some stamina. Good, George said, nodding his head. Do you mind if I ask you a question? If it's a good question, I don't mind. George enjoyed his new career as a trainer and loved every moment he spent with Kim. But he figured life had a certain path it followed, and part of that path involved the decline to death. This in mind, George asked, In your profile, you said that you want to live forever. Mind if I ask why? Square answered, Great question. But I'm sure my answer won't satisfy you. So how about you ask another question? George took the hint. All right, let me ask this. Gesturing with his arm, he made an arc motion. Do you really need this much space? I mean, isn't it a lot for just one person? Square ran for ten seconds without answering, and George was concerned he might have offended him. Square finally answered, The space isn't for my desk. It's for my mind. When you lock up a mind in a cramped space, the end result is small thinking. Interesting, George said, remembering how crowded the workspace was on the 92nd floor. How about the workers on 92? Do they have enough space to think? I'm beginning to like you, George. Contrary to what some of the staff might think, I love being challenged like this. If more people question their superiors, the better the world might be. As for the workers on the 92nd floor, they have access to other floors with more space. But the truth is, the nature of their work is vastly different from mine. Where they are merely carrying out directives, I'm saving mankind. Saving mankind? George didn't know how to respond to someone who thinks he's saving mankind. It sounded quite delusional, so it felt best to again change the topic. I see. I have a different question about your profile. What do you mean by push my body until it breaks? Seeming to ignore the question, Square answered George with a question of his own. Do you know the strongest muscle in the body is the masseter? George hadn't heard this muscle's name since he studied anatomy during his personal trainer certification classes. It's a muscle in the jaw? Correct. With all the jaw muscles working together, they can exert 200 pounds of pressure into the molders. Pound for pound, it can run circles around the largest muscle in the body, the gluteus maximus, which most people mistake as the strongest. George was also led to believe this during his martial arts training. After all, you never want to skip a leg day. George responded with, Interesting. Square continued, So now that we've established what the strongest and largest muscles in the body are, I ask you, do you know the weakest and smallest muscles in the body? I warn you, this is a tricky question. George thought for a second as they neared a corner. Honestly, I'm not sure I know. Square smiled as he kept pace with George. Right. Most people have no idea. And why should they? Everybody thinks the biggest and strongest muscles are more important. George pondered that maybe it was a muscle in the hand, or maybe the muscles controlling forehead movement. So what are they? George finally asked. I told you it would be tricky. The smallest and weakest muscles are one in the same. It's one muscle called the stapedius, located in the inner ear. It protects the auditory system from damage due to large sounds. It's similar to how eyelids block foreign objects from damaging the eyes. Square continued, Without this muscle regulating sound, any loud noise could damage your hearing and cause permanent deafness. Such a weak and small muscle in our heads playing such a vital role fascinates me. Okay, so this guy is smart. No client had ever been this knowledgeable about the body, but George had another concern he wanted to address. In your profile, you mentioned something else that concerns me. You weren't lying about your curiosity, were you? Speak your mind. Square said. Well, most clients just want to get six-pack abs to impress a girl or lose some weight to fit into a dress. I've not seen anyone who wants to, and I quote, reach and exceed my body's breaking point. Square furrowed his eyebrows. What's wrong with that? Well, it's unethical for me to help you self-harm if that's what you're trying to do. George, this has nothing to do with ethics. We aren't talking about animal testing or doing experiments on innocent people. I do this of my own free will, and I'm asking for your help. 
Was Kim right? Does this guy have some sort of guilty conscience? George found it curious that Square brought up animal testing without prompting. George's voice was steady. I want no part of an injury that could cause you a lifetime of pain. George spoke from experience. He hit his own pain well. George continued. I don't mind helping you get in shape or fit into a dress if that's your thing. Square chuckled at the dress part and smiled. If I was looking to just get into shape, I would have hired someone else. I promise you what we do here will be vastly beneficial. And I assure you, you are uniquely qualified for my needs. What does that mean? Look, no amount of money would make it okay for me to break your body. The second lap ended at the East 2 elevator, and they headed back towards the massage table. I assure you that if I get injured or hurt in any way, it won't be lifelong. I also don't have any sort of pain fetish, but this body of mine is temporary. Any damage that occurs to it is inconsequential. With all due respect, Mr. Poopenmacher, you obviously have never torn a rotator cuff, and it certainly won't feel inconsequential when you rupture your Achilles tendon due to overexertion, or break as many bones as I have. I'm not sure if I can participate in... George paused briefly, but he couldn't stop the words from coming out. This level of crazy. Square raised his hand as if to calm George down. George, you say it's crazy, but I know from my research that you yourself pushed your body to a point of breaking. The only difference is that for me, it won't be by accident or because of an unrealistic dream. Unrealistic dream? George was beginning to heat up. I'm not sure what you found when snooping around my life, but by no means were my dreams unrealistic. I appreciate your generous offer and I'm flattered that you think so highly of my training skills, but I'm not the right trainer for this job. I'm afraid I won't be able to help you. Square raised his voice with passion. You're wrong, George. You're exactly the right trainer for this. You've pushed your body to its breaking point more than once. You've broken bones, torn muscles, and before your career-ending fight, you were hospitalized with rhabdomyolysis that you were lucky to have survived. And despite all that, you still kept training. How on earth does he know about my rhabdomyolysis? George raised his voice. I don't appreciate being spied on. Exactly how did you get access to my private information? I've got my ways, Square said matter-of-factly. The thing is, a sane person would have stopped when their health was threatened like yours was. But you didn't stop. You have unique characteristics that this project and, frankly, I need to harness. How much does this guy know? My dark thoughts before I met Kim? No. No one could have known, even if George had opium enabled. Square continued in an aggressive tone. George, I'm a scientist and explorer of the human body. I need to push this body to its limits to know where it fails so I can best learn how to fix it. With your experience in both pushing and breaking your body, we can change mankind forever. Again with his delusional thoughts. I have no interest in changing mankind, nor do I want to deal with the aftermath of your injuries. George moved to gather his equipment. I'm sorry I wasted your time. George, listen. Your points are valid. If I were you, I would walk away also. He paused briefly, then continued. I've spent most of my life on this project, and I know the right person when I see them. So here's my proposal. I'll have our legal team prepare documents that absolve you of any liability and set clear boundaries. Next Thursday, after you review the documents, you can decide if you want to continue. Today, we can just do a standard workout. Does that sound fair? George paused to absorb the words, but still wanted to walk away. Let's see what these papers say on Thursday. The money was worth waiting to decide until Thursday. Worst case, he could earn another $2,250. Yeah, I'll look at the papers Thursday, George said. Square was beginning to say something as a call came in. Excuse me, George, he said, telling Omni to answer. A young woman's voice could be heard on the wide-angled sound wave. Candidate 237 is ready. Square's face lit up. He spoke back. I'll be down in a few minutes. He then turned his full body towards George. George, it's been a great session. I'm sorry I have to end it earlier than planned. Of course, I'll pay you for the full three hours. Can I assume I'll see you here at the same time next Thursday? George spoke. I'll be here, but I'll need you to add something to those papers you're going to prepare. What's that? Square said, perplexed. You'll need to promise to never look at my personal data ever again. If you want to know something about me, you can ask. And if I feel like telling you, I will. My rights to privacy will not be superseded no matter how important you think your project is. All right? 
Agreed? Agreed, Square answered. Can I assume you'll also be discreet with our conversation here as well? Square asked. You keep your nose out of my business, and I'll keep my nose out of yours. Sounds like a fair deal, Square said, extending his hand for a shake. George shook his hand. I'll see you Thursday. No, yeah, one more thing. Square couldn't imagine what else George might want to add to the agreement. Shania on floor 92 seems to think you might soon owe her team donuts. Square smiled a grin that covered his entire face. That's great news. Uh, don't let me forget your payment. While George gathered up his equipment, Square pulled cash from a locked desk drawer and put it in an envelope. George put the envelope filled with 2250 cash into his pocket and rode the elevator down with Square while holding his equipment. At floor 92, Square walked off of the elevator not looking back at George. It seemed the entire team on the floor had gathered in a huddle around one of the mannequins. George saw Shania's green hair poking up from the center of the huddle. There was quite a lot of chatter from the team, but George was certain he heard someone excitedly scream, He moved his finger! as the doors of the elevators closed.